2 Corinthians. We'll actually look, Chris, at what Jesus did say, because he quoted scripture three times. And uh, that, goes to the, that goes to the element of the crime. It goes to the plot of what Satan is after. We're, this is Satan. This class is Satan 101. I'm glad you could join us for Satan 101. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. That's a good verse to start, 13. Uh, For such are false apostles. I have a picture of one of those on the screen. See that hat he's wearing? That hat is thousands of years old. It derives from the priests of Dagon. The priests of Dagon, and we have evidence of this, um, because we have have carvings and drawings and pictures from ancient times of the Dagon priest. Dagon was half fish, half human. And... um, So every weekend he would go to the lake and catch himself. I didn't wake up like this, I can tell you that. But anyway, Dagon was a half human, half fish. And the priests then would adorn themselves with with a fish hat. It had the head of a fish with the mouth open. And then the, the back part of it would extend down their body and it would be the, the back and the tail of a fish. And that's how, and Dagon is mentioned in 1 Samuel 5 because Dagon is a, there's a God, there's a real God associated with the idol of Dagon. And it, it is Satan or whatever, but anyway, I think that the God behind the idol wanted this. It's, it's prophetic is what it is. Because they, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is God's throne. And remember, Satan, in Ezekiel 28, wants to sit on God's throne. He said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's Ezekiel 28. And then in Isaiah 14, I will ascend into heaven. I will be like the most high. That's what he said. So I've got it in my mind that Satan wanted that Ark of the Covenant. So they bring it to the temple of Dagon and set it in front of Dagon. And of course, the next morning they come in and Dagon has fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant because every knee is going to bow. Whether that knee's got scales or not, that knee's going to bow. So Dagon has fallen down in front of the Ark of the Covenant Dagon is such a mighty and a powerful God that his priest had to pick him back up. Okay, that's how powerful he is. And so then, the next morning, he's fallen down again, but his head and, and his, the trunk of his body is cut off. His arms or hands are cut off, broken off. And uh, so they're going, we're not messing with that anymore. And they got the ark out of their, they sent it to all five of the cities where the five lords of the Philistines were, and every place they sent it, thousands of people died from a plague. So they said, we're done with the Ark of the Covenant. And they, sent it, they said, the Jews can have it back, and they sent it back. But anyway, that is the headdress of the priests of Dagon. They still wear that to this day. Okay, That which was is that which shall be. No new thing under the sun. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Present tense, um, he is transformed in Paul's day. He is transformed uh, back in Isaiah. I think he's transformed in or uh, attempting to appear as transformed in the Garden of Eden. And to this day and in the future, 
Uh, Satan's desire is to be worshipped as God. He wants everybody to see him as God. So he is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also, he has ministers around the world, and not all of them wear Dagon fish hats. Okay? Some of them have a better disguise than that. So he's got ministers, uh, he's got his ministers all over the world, and they're transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And what that means is God's going to judge them by the works, and they, are, they appear as ministers of righteousness, but they have no righteousness. And so God is going to judge them according to to their deeds or according to their works. So we were looking at Satan. So let's go ahead and turn to Genesis 3 because uh, it is relevant to uh, where we're going this morning. I touched on part of this uh, last Sunday and uh, we're just going to move on from there. We're just learning Satan. We're not going to be ignorant. Um, 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, my, in, my prayer, my encouragement, my lesson to everybody it, throughout these lessons is for you to learn how, where, when Satan will try to get an advantage over you. With everybody, it's going to be different. There's only three ways, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It may be one of those three, it may be two of those three, or it may be all three. But with everybody, it's a little, they're, everybody's unique, everybody's a little different. Everybody's got their own private weaknesses, their own ways. The devil's not going to come after you on your strengths. He's going to come after you after your weaknesses. God is going to allow him to do this. There is no magic word that you recite, no power, no, you can't yell loud enough. I've heard people do that. Uh, you can't use forceful words or whatever to make Satan leave you forever and ever and ever. That didn't happen with Jesus. It doesn't happen with you. You're going to fight him until the day you die. And then we're going to come back and we're going to get victory. God of heaven is going to bruise Satan under our feet shortly. So, but until you die, you're fighting the devil. And you're going to fight him, some cases, day by day. Some days are going to be better, easier than others, but some days are going to be very, very difficult. And at times, God will allow you to be defeated by him. God will allow this to happen. Do not think that God has rejected you, God has left you alone. Do not think that uh, just because somebody you know appears to be living victoriously every day because they have this big smile on their face, some people just fake their way through Christianity. And to me, that doesn't, that doesn't serve anybody's interest. To fake your way through. And I've met some of these people that they're just all smiles and all Jesus all the time. And they put on a big show in front of I went to Bible college with some of these guys. I mean, they could not answer a simple question, but what they faked praise to Jesus in every bit of it. One guy says, hey, is it going to rain today? Well, praise God. I hope it. Praise God. If it does, then praise God. And you could not get an answer out of this guy, but what he faked praise to Jesus in every bit of it. And I saw right through it. I'm going, you're a phony. You're a big fake and a phony. Nobody, nobody who lives a Christian life lives like that. Nobody does. And God will either love this guy and beat the daylights out of him or let the devil just chew him up and bring him down out of his high-mindedness or God will reject him and he'll be like this, and the devil will chew him up anyway. And he'll be exposed for what he is. But don't let fake, phony Christians make you think that they live victorious every day and they have no problems out of the devil. It's not true. It's a setup. It's what it is. So anyway, uh, let's, let's learn Satan's devices. So back in Genesis 3, device number 1, and we touched on this uh, last week. 
Satan questions the authority of God's word and the authenticity of God's word. So he says, yea, hath, that's first thing out of his mouth is a question. Yea, hath God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden. So turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to see this in the reality of the devil trying to um, tempt Jesus. Somebody give me your theory, your opinion, your fact or whatever. Why was Satan trying to tempt God? Why was he trying to tempt Jesus here? Does anybody want to take a guess? It's related to why it's related to why he was doing what he was doing in the Garden of Eden, and it's related to how he was doing it. Those, these are his devices. What was the first thing Satan said? Yea, hath God said. Why did he say that? Why was he questioning or getting Eve to question the authority of God's word? What was the end game? What was his goal? Trying to undermine God's word so that he could... So he could replace it. Let's go. Genesis 3. Yea, hath God said, you should not eat of every tree in the midst of the garden. Questioning God's word. Number two. Contradicting God's word. Ye shall not surely die. Number three. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That... That third part there is Satan's replacement of what God said. He has a replacement doctrine. He has a replacement word. Therefore, he has a replacement for Jesus. So look at Matthew 4, verse 6. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God. Notice the question. If. There's actually a church. One of these new age, mega church, wannabe churches. Their, their name is Imagination Fellowship. But their signs have the initials. I-F. If. That's their church name. If. Imagination Fellowship. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Um, Lindsay showed it to me the other day. The spiritual wickedness in Jefferson County is great. And it's great even in the churches. We used to have, when we had a Christian school here, we used to have a student here. This student was, was raised in fundamental churches. Her family went to these so-called conservative fundamental churches. She was a student here. And we had suspicions about her. She graduated here. She was a high school student. And we had suspicions even then about her. About whether she would find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. So she's now married. And her and her wife are raising a child. And she goes to a church in this county up in Arnold, and they help with the vacation Bible school, and they help in the Sunday school class, and they're just open and accepted. There. And it's obvious, it is blatantly obvious, when you see that, you know, you can just look at some people, okay? And you're just going, yeah, okay? Well, it is blatantly obvious when you see these two women coming into church with their child that they are raising, that they are openly practicing and acceptedly married sodomites. And so I've looked into this church. I watched some of their sermons and some of their services. And I can tell you, they feel very comfortable in that church. There's no condemnation at all. Okay? And I'm just telling you, the spiritual wickedness is, is growing in Jefferson County, Missouri. We're surrounded. We're surrounded. To question the authenticity of God's word. To, and one of the sermons that this guy preached was on the family. And he said, 
I'm not going to give you scripture verses, but I am going to give you scripture ideas. So in this sermon, no verses. And it was on the family, and it was basically everybody in the family is equal to one another. And he, he concentrated on this idea that Paul said in Ephesians 5, that, that uh, let us therefore submit ourselves one to another. He made it sound like that nobody should be in authority, but we should all submit and bow to one another in families, in any kind of hierarchy, and that's related to what I'm going to preach this morning. What that is, is open rebellion. It's open rebellion. It's open rebellion to God's word. It's open rebellion to biblical areas of authority. And I'm just telling you, there are pretend churches in Jefferson County. And probably at some point, I'll tell you what church it is. But anyway, the idea of what Satan wanted in, Ma in Genesis 3 and in Matthew 4 was to replace Jesus as the Word of God. Remember John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was manifest, and the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. So there's no doubt that Satan knows who Jesus is. He is the Word of God, and his goal was to attack the Word of God so it could be replaced. If I get, he's thinking, if I get Jesus to sin... Then the word of God now is defiled. Now I can replace it because that's what he wants. That's why he cast the tares in among the wheat. That's why um, in the parable where, I can't remember exactly where it is, but in the parable where uh, the husbandman of the farm is gone away, but he's sending messengers back to, to see how the farm's going and they keep, killing the messengers, finally he sends his son to check on it. And they say, if we kill the son, we can then have the farm. We can steal the inheritance because there'd be nobody to take this piece of land. If we kill the son, nobody can inherit this and we'll take it. That's the goal. Kill the son, replace the son, get the word out of the way and then replace it with something else. So Matthew, uh, Matthew 4 that's the, that's the game. He said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. And the devil's hoping that Jesus will jump. Now you listen to me. Because most people have run into a situation in life where the devil said, jump. Jump off this cliff. Kill yourself. God will, God will protect you. You'll still go to heaven. Don't worry about it. I'm talking about suicide. Most people, not everybody, but most people have at a time in their life run into situations where the devil said, I got you now. Why don't you just end your life? Because God obviously has abandoned you. Or... Don't worry about it. God still loves you. Why don't you end your life now and everything will be okay. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Because Jesus said, in fact, let's, let me, let's look here. Uh, we're at Matthew 4. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now, I want you to remember that Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days and he's very hungry and he's very weak. And I'm telling you, the devil doesn't go after the strong. He goes after the weak. The lions, when the lions run into a herd of water buffalo, their first choice is the young buffaloes or the sick ones. Not the head bull. That's their first choice, is to kill the weakest among them. And Jesus is very, very weak. He's had no nourishment for 40 days. And so even emotionally, he's weak. Physically, he's drained. And the devil said, end your life. Maybe the angels will come and bear thee up. 
He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So now in verse 7, Jesus said unto them, It is written again. I like that statement. Excuse me, devil. I'm going to quote scripture again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I'm going to say this to all you Bible believers. Do not tempt God concerning your salvation. Do not ever tempt God by saying, I can sin all I want to. God has to forgive me. Don't you dare do that. Don't you dare think that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto them, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus saith unto him, nah. <laughs> he saith unto him, get thee hence, Satan. Now remember, two things. Satan is a beast and God put it in him to have a fear of the man. The man is Jesus. And Jesus said, get thee hence. And when he did that, Satan left him because of the natural fear that God put in him, Genesis chapter 9, that's what God said. Uh, he, he said concerning man, a fear of thee and a dread of thee will be in all, all the beasts and, so, and, it's, and all the fish and all that you cannot catch squirrels, you cannot catch birds, and you cannot, I cannot catch fish. I have a terrible time catching fish, okay? I don't bait the hook right or whatever. I'm not patient enough or I make a lot of noise or whatever. But fish are just naturally scared of me. My dad, on the other hand, if there was one fish in the Mississippi River, dad had him by the end of the day. Okay, but anyway, that's the goal was to get Jesus out of the way. Remember, he's the word because he has a replacement, Jesus. He has a replacement word. And so the end game is to replace the Bible in a person's life or in a church or in a whole denomination or in a Bible college or seminary or in a young, a young man's life. These young men that grow up in churches where they're preached the word of God, then they go to the Bible college or the seminary and that Bible is day by day taken away from them because they are taught the Bible has errors, it has mistakes in it, it has, it's, we, don't, we have no idea what God really said. Even if you read the Hebrew and Greek, the Hebrew and Greek um, manuscripts that we have, they're constantly revising them, they're constantly updating them. Con there's, there's no way that we can know for sure what the Bible ever really said. But don't you dare tell that to the churches. That's what Pastor Rock admitted to us, that the Bible college he went to in India. What he told me was, the Bible college he went to in India was supposed to be King James only. And that's what they told the American churches that they were getting support from. So the money would keep rolling in. But they told the students, we don't really believe that. And we're going to show you that we're right so you won't really believe it. But when it comes to you standing in front of your church, don't tell them that. And I've heard that on a video from Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University is supposed to be this conservative school, but when they got it, they got themselves into the King James Bible debate, and they had they made their own video of their esteemed professors going around saying, "Oh yes, we love the King James. We preach out of the King James, but we all know that it's not perfect." But we don't tell our churches that. In a roundabout way, that's what they were saying. Makes me sick. So that right there, when the devil gets you or gets a church or anybody to the place where they don't believe that everything in God's word is right, 
then wherever they think it's wrong, the devil is the one who supplies the replacement word or the replacement verse. Any way he can, he's going to provide a replacement for what God said. Doesn't matter if it's the whole Bible or one verse. That's what he's going to, that's his goal, that's his aim. And, and as it progresses, a little leaven does what? Leaven's a whole lump. So it starts out years ago with, there's only a couple of places in the King James that we question. But what happens to that as the days go by? It turns into more and more and more and more of it is full of errors as the days go by. And then throughout the years, we don't even use the King James anymore. We don't touch it. We have nothing to do with it. So it's gone. And now all these, now, the, now they, they have the replacement Bibles, but then, like I heard the other day, the minister preaching this message, actually saying, I'm not giving you Bible verses, but I am giving you Bible ideas. So, he preaches a whole message with no word from God. And everybody loved it. It's a great message. We just, oh, we just love our pastor to death. He preaches, oh, he tells us good things. But he's not giving them the word of God. So that's the plan. Here's what it looks like in the new Bibles. You have these footnotes. In the NIV. 1 John 5, 7. The one at the top. 1 John 5, 7 says. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. But they say this is not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. Now that's not... Technically, that's really not true. It actually goes back to 1000 A.D., not the 14th century. But what they say is, this is not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. So they're saying, this verse does not belong in the Bible, so we didn't put it in the NIV. Acts 8.37, where the Ethiopian eunuch says, here is water, what doth hinder me from being baptized? Acts 8.37 says, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's Acts 8.37. So the footnotes for the NIV say, some Greek manuscripts exclude this verse. The NIV related footnote for 8.36 states, some manuscripts include here, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So with them saying some Greek manuscripts include this verse, we didn't put it in the Bible, and you don't have to believe that as part of God's Word if you don't want to. Or, in uh, Luke, I think it's Luke 17, 21, some, or Matthew, Matthew 17, 21, says, This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So the NIV says, Some Greek manuscripts exclude this verse. The NIV-related footnote for some manuscripts include here words similar to Mark 9.29. In other words, Mark 29, 9.29 is the second witness that says, This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. They took it out. But they tell you, we had good reason to take it out because we don't think it should have belonged in the Bible to begin with, so you don't have to believe that this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So, when you are battling devils and you've been convinced that prayer and fasting has nothing to do with it, you're going to lose the battle. And I met, I encountered a man when I was preaching down in southern Missouri, preaching a revival, and I brought it up, and, and he jumped me after the service. And I said to him, so what? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You don't believe that? And he, his words to me were, I don't believe that. That was never supposed to be part of the Bible. And I don't believe that. Said, well, thank you for being honest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it already worked in his life. He was staunch and adamant with me. 
that he didn't believe that this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. He did not believe that and said it should never be part of the Bible. How does he know? My NIV footnotes told me so. That's the authority that he's relying on. The footnotes in his NIV were authority to him. So I'm not, I'm not making stuff up to tell you this so to get you to keep following what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that there are people who already believe this way. The transition process is already, it, it's already done. And now we're moving into the next phase. Since we don't have the word of God, then let's look elsewhere for the word of God. And that's the goal. For God doth know, then in the day the eat thereof, then, and so let's, worst timing. Let me do this part. Ye shall not surely die. That directly contradicts God's word. Directly contradicts it. So, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. These people over here say, no it doesn't. You don't need prayer and fasting. 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This group over here says, we don't need that verse. We don't need that verse to believe in the Godhead. And yet, show me another verse in any Bible, NIV, New American Standard, New King, show me a verse in a new Bible that actually solidifies the doctrine that the Godhead, though they are three, they are one singular entity. And that's what we're to believe. Show me the verse. It doesn't exist. If you take that out of the Bible, you do not have a Godhead. Even though other verses allude to the Godhead, like when Jesus came out of the water, his Father from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit lit upon his shoulder you have verses that allude to it but you do not have a verse anywhere that states in no uncertain terms that the godhead is three and yet they are one you have no other verse you take that one out the doctrine is missing you have to assume then in order to believe it so what's going to happen is over time People are not going to assume that anymore because it's not there in their Bible. They're just not going to believe it. So the apostasy is at hand. It's coming rapidly. And the end game is a new doctrine that says we accept two married sodomite women as being equal with us, so much so that we will use them to train children. I mean, I would love for these two women to come to our church. Knowing that they were here, I promise you, I would preach to them in gentle love. But I would preach the truth to them in hopes that they would be saved. Because one of the girls, I know for a fact, knows better. She just chooses to not, she believes herself to be a Christian, but she chooses not to believe that what she's doing is in error. Okay? So I would love for them to come here, and I promise you I would preach to them gently and lovingly the truth of the Word of God so that they would be, hopefully they would be converted. But to accept them in and then give them immediately a role teaching your grandchildren and your children in the Sunday school class and the vacation Bible school, not a chance. Not a chance. That's not being mean. That's not being cruel. It's not that I hate them. It's just that that's not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen. But it is. Okay? And this is a big church. Well-known church. I'll give you the name. The real reason why I'm not giving you the name is I don't remember it. If it would come to my mind, I'd be mean enough to say it. But I, but I can tell you where it is, all right? Listen, you're under attack. You're going to be under attack. You need to learn Satan's devices. Because he will replace God's word the moment he gets the first chance to in your life. 
And my brothers, my sisters, without God's word, you are not saved. You don't stand a chance. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this book. Thank you for what it says, what it means, what it is. Thank you, God, that I do not have to sit and make up a Sunday school lesson. The lesson is right here in the Word. I pray, God, that you would bless your Word, solidify it in our minds. Father, let there be a revival of your Word in the hearts and lives of those, Lord, who are here, those who are listening in online. Father, let there be a revival of your Word every day in their hearts and their lives. Father, the more we read, the more excited we get about what this word says. Lord, I've learned things this week, studying things that I thought I knew already. And I thank you for it, God. I thank you, God, that every day we have another chance to learn something else from this wonderful, amazing book that we didn't know yesterday. Thank you, God. Bless it, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.